Hi, everybody, and welcome to our next Leadership Lesson Series. I'm so grateful to be joined today by the CEO of Trinet, my friend, Burton Goldfield. Hey, Burton. Nice to see you, Jason. Nice to see you as well, too. For those of you that are joining us for the first time, I'm Jason Nazar. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Comparably and the host of this series. Thank you so much. For those of you that are coming back for the 20th, 25th episode, thank you for joining us as well. Uh, Comparably is an online employee review platform and a platform to help companies with their employer brand and recruitment marketing. And I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've now started five different companies and I've had the pleasure and good fortune of having amazing mentors and folks that I've learned from along the way, like Burton, that have taught me so much. And so we do this series really to help folks like Burton share their incredible story about their journey, their lessons. And so thank you all. You're in for a real treat today. Burton is one of the CEOs that I've known for a long time and looked up to. Uh, Burton, I know so many of us are customers uh, of Trinet. We use your services to manage our teams. But, you know, in your own words, how do you describe the business today? Well, first, thanks for having me. I am in awe of your success over the years, and I am a huge fan. I am Burton Goldfield. I am the CEO of Trinet. I've been at Trinet for 13 years, and I am absolutely honored to lead a team of great people that provide HR solutions for small and medium businesses. We are working with over 17,000 companies in the U.S., and we have a team of over 2,500 people servicing those 17,000 companies. So we get involved in payroll and benefits and HR solutions. And the key is that we use scale in service of these small and mid-sized businesses. So whether we're developing a line of code or lobbying for small businesses, it accrues to each of the 17,000 companies that are out there. And we are passionate about watching companies grow like Jason's, serial, serial entrepreneurs do a great job over and over again, and hoping that the world is a better place because of the output of these amazing small and medium businesses. So, you know, I'd love to dive in in a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit of your career journey. Before we do that, um, you know, you and I have this shared experience of spending so much of our career helping small businesses. And it's not an easy thing to reach the number of clients that you do to touch and influence so many folks. What do you feel like as you look back over the last decade plus that you've been at Trinet has been the secret of your success in terms of helping and connecting with so many small businesses? I think that is taking it very personally. So my greatest strength is always my greatest weakness. To me, this is very personal. Seeing people succeed, I feel the joy of their success. When there's challenges or opportunities or failures, I feel their failures. Every single week, I am talking to small businesses, current customers, prospects, mentoring folks, because I am constantly learning and it tests who I am as I face those challenges. So if there's one secret to success is that I take things very personal. It also has its limitations, particularly when you're running a New York Stock Exchange $4 billion company. Yeah. Well, it's incredible to see what you've done with the market cap of Trinet over these last years. And we'll come back to more of that. You know, I, I'd love to kind of go back to like the start of your career because, you know, we were talking before this, it, it's not as if you were born with a silver spoon. There was pretty auspicious beginnings for you. Like what was your model growing up? Were, you, were your parents entrepreneurial? Like what gave you that drive to become the CEO of a public company? So I was born and raised in inner city Philadelphia in West Oak Lane. No, I did not come from an entrepreneurial family, but education was stressed. And what was great for me is I had an aptitude for science and math and a great love for it. So ultimately, I was able to apply that with technology. I graduated high school and I went into college and uh, was asked to be part of the first graduating class in biomedical engineering. I said, if you'll pay for it, I'll be in your first graduating class. So a lot of luck is involved, but also saying yes. 
I didn't really know what a biomedical engineer was, but I knew that having my degree paid for was a really good thing at that time. And the background that I had in science and math was very helpful. So I graduated in the 70s. Most of the people listening were probably not even born then with the first biomedical engineering degree that was offered by Syracuse University. What I found was people were much more interested in my ability to program a computer. And between you and I, I wasn't that good but there weren't many people in the late 70s that knew how to program a computer. So the fact was I did not use the education and strength of materials as they were starting to develop artificial hip, hip joints and other things. I used my basic programming skills and ended up in the very early days of the technology boom. And again, it was both an opportunity where I said yes, and also luck that I had that opportunity. So ultimately, I moved to Silicon Valley because programming computers in Philadelphia was not a thing at that time. And I figured if I was gonna be a coal miner, I'd go to West Virginia. And if I was gonna be in the software space, I would go to Palo Alto, California. So the way the story goes is I came to Palo Alto and I went to the Hewlett Packard garage on Addison. Well, when I was growing up, I was in awe of Bill and David. I was truly in awe of the company that they created, their excellence in all areas that they were executing in. And I will agree, it may not be the same company today, but I believed that if I lived close to the garage on Addison, I could use that as a foundation and draw a lot of positive energy from what they were doing. So I ended up settling in Palo Alto and now I am still living there today because I've been too busy to move anywhere else. So that's how I got to California from Philadelphia. That's where, how I got into the computer and technology industry way back in the late eighties. Uh, I'd love to kind of dissect, um, you know, some of these like soft skills that you had or developed over the course of your career that helped you to get where you are. And I often talk to my team about like the, the folks that are most successful. It's not because of what they know. It's not because of the biggest expert. It's because they're folks that other people want to work with and for. It's because they've got great EQ. It's because they've got great judgment. You know, as you like, you have this incredible career that so many of us would be envious of, of being this leader at different organizations, you know, going into a CE role, having so much success. What were some of these, the more soft skills that you either felt like you had innately or that you developed along the way that were the key to your success? I believe that I am a good judge of people. Surrounding yourself with great people is a critical element of success and certainly was of mine. Again, there's a lot of luck involved. My first true company in this arena was Rational Software. I didn't go there because of the products. I went there because of my true admiration and love for the founders. Mike Devlin and Paul Levy were truly amazing. I met them on the interview and we went from 19 million to over a billion when IBM bought us. I stuck with it for 14 years through the dot-com boom when anybody who lived in Palo Alto and had a pulse was offered a CEO job. And I was asked, why aren't you gonna leave a quote old, we were eight years old, stodgy $400 million company. I had no interest in leaving. I wanted to continue to build the company that I was part of. And I think the third thing I would say, which ties to those first two, is a sense of belonging as part of a team, being a teammate and feeling like every morning I want to contribute to the team. So I do believe I boot up positively every morning and want to do the best job I can. But if you're not surrounded with great people, it's really hard to have a true impact. Yeah, I often say, 
you know, to folks when they're thinking about their next career step, make a bet on people. Like, obviously your salary is important, other key aspects of the job, but first and foremost, like if you make a bet on the right people, they'll be there with you. They'll open up doors in your career. They'll advance your career. It sounds like you largely do that as well too. What are the key characteristics you look for in Trinet employees? You know, like if, if what's your scorecard of the three or four or five qualities that you're most looking for to add somebody to your team? So I have a hiring model that I developed very early and it's largely successful. It's not always successful, but it's largely successful. And it is about hiring for core values and motivation because knowledge, skills, and experience, and those are the five categories, they can be learned on the job. You cannot change somebody's core values. And I'll give you some examples, and you cannot change their motivation in a business setting. So the things you can't change in a business setting, you better hire for. And this is not about good or bad, it is about fitness for purpose of the mission that you're on. And if you're trying to build an enduring company over a long period of time, and you're trying to do it with a team approach, again, both of those are arguably right or wrong. I have friends that flip companies every two years and they are largely more successful than I am. But again, it's fitness for purpose. So you're not evaluating people that they're good or bad. You're evaluating where their core values and their motivation is what you need for the mission that your company is on. Because at the end of the day, you're the CEO and you have to drive the result that you're looking for. So what I mean by that is it makes no sense to declare that you're a team and you want shared leadership and you want great ideas to bubble to the top and then hire people who need to be acknowledged each and every day as number one, numero uno, the best. But that's not a bad trait if you're trying to drive a certain result. If you have those people on your team and say, hey, we're here to share ideas, but at the end of the day, Jason, your idea is always the best. So we're going to wait for your idea. Then you shut people down. So there is reasons why you want people who want to be acknowledged individually as the, as the best, but there's also reasons why you want the team approach to be able to explore strategic alternatives and drive a more nebulous market to a successful outcome. So that's an example of a, 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 an area of motivation. If somebody is motivated by having to be recognized all the time, as being better than everybody else on the team, don't claim that the team approach is going to work in your organization. If the idea is to rack and stack people and motivate them against each other, those are the right people for the job. So that's the idea around motivation. Core values is a little bit more complex. Uh, for me, you can't change somebody's core values. Again, I'm not evaluating whether you're more ethical or unethical than I am, that's a whole different discussion. It's where do you want to operate? In what range do you want to operate your company in? Are you going to be on the line, occasionally over the line? Are you want to be straight down the center? How do you want to run the company? And what is the overall culture of the company? Because everybody is watching you. Everybody is watching you as a CEO and how you act, not only personally, but how you act towards your leadership team. So core values and motivation are number one and number two in my mind. When it comes to knowledge, skills, and experience, I've been involved where we taught COBOL programmers to program in C when the C language came out. You can take great people and retrain them. So knowledge, skills, and experience, you can get that in a team setting with your company. You can change core values and motivation. So I have a chart. I evaluate people on that chart. And it's not that I haven't made mistakes. I have made mistakes, but this has largely guided me in my career in finding the people that I want to work with 
in the environment and the mission and the vision of the company that I'm building. So I'd love to dig in there and get some more of your tactical advice on how you actually stress test for that. So I love this, this idea that we're really measuring to start, you know, the core values and, um, you know, somebody's motivation. If you were interviewing a VP or an SVP or a C-level candidate at Trinet, right, obviously you're going to rely on referrals and everything there, but what's the, what, do you, what process would you go through? What do you do with that candidate to actually stress test to see that they have the motivations and values that line up with your company today? So the good news is after more than 25 years here in Silicon Valley, I know somebody who knows you. And you already made the point, the unsolicited references are really important. But they're not only important because Jason's a good guy or not a good guy. I can come up with specific challenges that you had at DocStock or you had in your career at Intuit. And then I'll confront you with them and say, Jason, how did you deal with this challenge? How did you deal with the down years in 2000? And it's how you respond to the question that gives me a good idea of who you are and what your motivation is. If, if it's, I took the team and I set them in a room and I did this and I did that, again, I know your track record it's obvious you are where you are, but how you approach those problems gives me insight into your core values and your motivation. And then the second area is that everything you've ever done and I've ever done is out there. Mm -hmm. So I know if there's issues that I believe, and again, it's not a rating, are limiting from a motivation or core value standpoint, and they would be concerning to me if they're outside the line, again, for what we're trying to accomplish. Yeah. You've been a part of so many really incredible organizations before you got to Trinet. You know, as you think of the, you know, one or two places where you learned the most important lesson that you took with you as a CEO or, or the person that was the most important mentor and what you learned from them, you know, what would those situations be and who might those people be? So the good news is the list isn't that long. I spent 14 years at Rational and we grew it from 19 million to a billion. We sold it to IBM. Uh, you know, my first love, what can I tell you? It was a great company, a great team and a very successful exit um, with 2.2 billion going to IBM. I went to IBM and I thought I learned, a tr or I did learn a tremendous amount at IBM. It wasn't an environment that I could be in long term, but the problems that they faced as an $89 billion company were amazing to watch. I had always thought as I wrung my hands at 100 million or 200 million that we had challenges. What I saw at IBM was a group of people wrestling with a set of problems that were phenomenal. I had the opportunity to spend time with the chairman then, Sam Paul Mazzano, on a regular basis. And I learned a lot from him. I learned a lot from John Joyce, who was the CFO. I have learned at every place I've went. From there, going to Hyperion, again, a phenomenal company with a great exit. So I do believe I'm a very, very lucky guy. I learned from great people at Hyperion. The chairman, Jeff Rodick, is phenomenal and has done great things in his career. Uh, I worked for a Kleiner Perkins startup, which was my first CEO job. I can't say enough good about Ted Schlein and the Kleiner Group that supported me there. So I do believe I've been around some people that have shaped me and my career. They've tested me on what I wanna do and get excited. It's almost an embarrassment to come to Trinet and have the opportunity again, which I think is far bigger than all the ones I've had to date. So we were about $100 million. We're now about four and a half billion. We're just getting started as a company. So that's why I keep coming back to, I've had a lot of luck and I have a lot of gratitude 
because at the end of the day, I get to wake up every morning, work with great people and solve really interesting problems. And, and what more really is there? Mm -hmm. You have this really unique blend to me, which is you've got this background in engineering, right? You've led this digital transformation at Trinet, but you're also this really incredible sales leader. And one of the things that I often wish is that sales was something that was taught as like primary education in high school and college. Like there, there's nothing you do in your career, whether you're an entrepreneur or trying to get a, a raise or trying to advance in your career where sales isn't so incredible and so vital. You know, one of the things to me, naturally, you always do like every conversation I've ever had with you, you make it about the other person. Like not only are you so naturally complimentary, but you just intuitively make it about them, which to me is one of the fundamental principles of successful sales folks. I'd love to just pick your brain for a moment because we have a lot of sales leaders and professionals that listen to the series. We have a lot of entrepreneurs that are trying to raise capital and recruit folks. As you think about like the core principles of sales that anyone needs to apply to be successful, whether they're an account executive or just trying to advance in their career, like what's, what's your sales philosophy there and how would you try to coach or guide somebody of how they can get better in that arena? It's hard to fake it. I believe you have to have a genuine interest in other people. I love hearing what you're doing when we catch up. I love going and seeing my clients, taking apart their devices, talking to them about their markets, because it, it gets me energized. It absolutely, we have a nonprofit vertical. I have some of the most amazing clients in the nonprofit vertical. Um, people like the Rose in Houston, Texas, that are out there doing breast cancer screening for over 29,000 women in the outer parishes of Houston. I catch up with them regularly to see how they're doing, because to me, the work they're doing is so impactful, but it's a genuine interest. It's not, it, it's not a technique. I'm not a big fan of sales techniques. It is about what gets you jazzed to be able to do it. And the, 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 the move to sales is interesting because we built some software and we looked around the room and said, who's going to go out and sell it? This is really early in my career. And they said, well, Burton should do it. <laughs> and I was dumb enough to hop on a plane and head to Hartford Hospital in Connecticut in front of a bunch of CFOs and pitch a financial solution. And I'm an engineer that knew nothing about finance. And I knew how the software works, but that was about it. But for me, it was just fun to be in front of these people. And at the end of the day, they gave me a break because they realized I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. Um, I want to do the time machine. Uh, exercise here, right? So a big part of this series is if I knew then. So if you could take a time machine and go back into your 30s and you could talk to that <laughs> version of Burton, what advice would you give him and why? Well, first of all, I would tell an earlier version of Burton, it's all going to work out. It's going to be more amazing than you ever dreamed. One, one of the challenges I have, Jason, is I mentor a bunch of people and they always say, when did you know you wanted to be a CEO? Because they're out of college and life has been very linear for them. Mm -hmm. And my answer is always the same, which is when I know I want to be a CEO, I'll let you know. And that always disappoints them because they're saying, I want to be a VP by X year. I never, ever, I can be honest with you, two things. I never chased money. It did come to me. And I never had any particular desire for a title. I had a desire to be around people that I cared about and believed in and could learn from. And I wanted to be given a big, gnarly problem to solve. And I also wanted to solve it and go back and say, see, I did it. Yeah. So same question, but maybe let's shorten the timeline to, you know, 15 or so years ago. If you could take a time machine back to the beginning of when you started at Trinet. Obviously, you had this incredible run. You took the company public. It's had such amazing results since then. You've grown so quickly. 
you know, what are the things you've learned over the last decade plus of being the CEO and running this public company that you wish you maybe knew when you started at Trinet? How hard it is to innovate and change. Innovation and change, frankly, in startups is much easier because you're burning cash. You have to get out of your own way and you have a mandate. Trinet has been a successful company for many years. The idea of an impatient CEO going, we have to continue to innovate. We have to continue to change. And Burton, why aren't you happy yet? I don't, I don't wake up content. I wake up happy, but it is the lack of being content that helps you as a CEO, or at least it helps me to drive the innovation. I think 15 or 12 years or 13 years ago when I started here, I would never have guessed how hard you have to push to get innovation in a company that is already successful. Because the metric around profitability and growth is an important metric and certainly an important metric as a public company. But for me, the metric is around impact. The fact that somebody like Jason is loyal to Trinet, the fact that I can go in to a supermarket here in Palo Alto and people come up to me and say, hey, you guys help me with this. Or as it related to the pandemic with the PPP loans, we got our loan really early and your guys were a big help. Impact is very important to me. The, the revenue and the profit is the exhaust out the back. It needs to be watched carefully but you're not chasing revenue and profit. You're chasing value. You're chasing execution. You're chasing hiring great people. And when you put it all together, the revenue and profit comes out of the back end. But innovation is risky. And I would say, and this is probably controversial, it's harder to find people who aren't risk adverse today compared to the early 90s and the late 90s. Yeah. We would do a startup with no benefits, a bunch of options that had no value, and we'd sit there and try to build companies from nothing. And, and I don't believe that that was right and being risk adverse is wrong, but there's some balance between the two that is certainly hard to do, particularly if there's not a gun to your head and you're not generating a lot of cash like we are. Yeah. One of the things I'm curious to get your take on. So, you know, I appreciate you bringing it up. I had this, you know, fortunate experience to be part of Intuit for a while. And like you, I spent 20 years of my professional career, really from, you know, 17 to 36, helping small, starting small businesses and helping small businesses, you know? And I think one of the things that was so unique like we came into Intuit when they were transitioning QuickBooks to a cloud-based platform. Yep. It was there for that little bit of a window as they were taking this traditional desktop software and bringing it online. You know, my experience too is that it's, it's really easy at larger companies. It's much easier to say no than yes. Yep. The safe thing to do is to say no. Like here's what we're working, here's what we're doing. You know, like you have a business now that there's so many people coming up, raising venture capital, going over after that space, you have to simultaneously, you know, keep hitting these numbers and performing for what your core business is, but you have to keep inventing the future. How do you, how do you find that right balance and how do you cultivate the right balance at a much bigger company like you're running today in a public company where you have folks that can hit the numbers they're responsible for but also be the change agents that are gonna help invent the future for you. You have done a great job there, Jason, of articulating the challenge. So that's exactly it. That is the challenge of the CEO, and that is my challenge. The way I approach it is always go back to the customer. What do they need today? What do they need in the future? Look, the, the, the uh, pandemic has accelerated technology 10 years and nine months. That's my belief. And we need to accelerate our innovation at the same level. People, and this is speaking from my experience in talking to customers, they want answers faster. They want them to be more fulsome. They want more services. 
They want much user, much more user friendly interfaces. You name it, everything is sp uh, sped up. So I am taking the direct connection with my customer base to make sure I'm driving innovation, but also the right innovation here at Trinet. It's not about printing up at the, you know, at the end of the supply chain. It is about real value. It's about taking the data that we have and applying that data to our customer base. Again, scale and service of our customers. If we have knowledge, we need to be able to transfer that knowledge to every one of the 17,000 plus customers, not a week later. We're holding seminars now every week on every topic, including return to work, but sometimes overnight as the legislation was being drafted and approved based on the PPP loans, we were going 24 hours a day with our team in Washington because we didn't know what the outcome was gonna be the next morning. And we were asked those questions. If you had asked me five years ago, do I need to have answers to questions about new legislation in three or four hours after passing? I would have laughed at you. Over the next five to 10 years, the ability to take knowledge and distribute that knowledge, which is part of what you do in your business today, is going to accelerate. The ability to have that knowledge help make decisions is going to accelerate even further. So I, I think that ultimately, back to your question about how you innovate in a company that's doing four plus billion dollars, you go back to the customer base, you find out what they need, and you tirelessly stand in front of your teams and say, it is about the customer, period, full stop. What does the future of your business look like a decade from today? Because it feels like the PEO services is just like the table stakes these days. And you know, even small businesses have such higher expectations of what their partners and vendors and platforms are going to do for them. When you think about you know, what Trinet's going to look like 10 years from today. What yeah. does that business look like to you? I, I think you're absolutely right. So the small businesses, in my mind, have been underserved for a long time. People like you and I were in businesses that were chasing originally the big customers. So at the end of the day, a lot of that technology did not filter down to the small businesses. Today, Small businesses are the future of our country, and ultimately, they want the best technology and the best services. I believe it's building out the services capability around Trinet. I have never been in a business where I have CEOs call and say, you're our trusted advisor. What more can you do for us? Can you provide legal services? Can you provide accounting services? Can you help us negotiate um, our leases, either getting out of them or getting into them. You're already a trusted advisor. So the ability to broaden the value of what Trinet does, already acting as a trusted advisor, will help us become even more sticky and more valuable. And frankly, leverage the great relationships we have with all of these CEOs and CFOs in the companies that we serve. Yeah, I love that. Um, you have this obviously unique perspective, having taken Trinet public. You know, today this is happening you know, in a lot of different ways. So I'm curious to get your thoughts and perspective on folks that are thinking about going public. Obviously, a lot of companies are doing this earlier than before through SPACs. There's there's more money out there in the investment world than I think you and I have ever seen before. You see this anywhere from Series Seed companies. <laughs> public companies to buyouts and private equity, you know, there's a lot of capital that's looking for deals. And so a lot of folks today probably have an opportunity to go public where they didn't, you know, five years ago and don't have the metrics that a lot of companies like you had to have when you went public. What advice and perspective would you share for folks that are contemplating an IPO today? So it's a great question. And I'm going to start for uh, advice for people seeking money or being offered money. One of the uh, most frequent questions that I get as a mentor is, should I take money? And to me, 
you got to figure out what you're trying to do first, because at the end of the day, what's so great about being a CEO, and there's a lot of things that aren't so great, is that you get to drive the direction of your company. And ultimately, what is your goal? How do you measure success? For me, it's very clear. I know exactly how I measure success. It's about having an impact. It's, being, it's about surrounding myself with great people. Um, it's about interfacing with the customer base that I have and really enjoying and getting energy out of it. So I'm not conflicted on what I want to do. But the problem when somebody says, should I take money? My answer always is, I don't know. What is your declaration of success? Tell me that first. If you're developing an app, want to make a million dollars and believe that you can live on a Caribbean island for the rest of your life with a million dollars, I wouldn't take a dime. I would eat beans, finish your app, get the million dollars, make the decisions yourself, and don't include anybody, including your family, and go off, declare victory, and live on that island. If you're out there to cure cancer, it's not going to be a matter of, should I take money? It's going to take decades to do. Then the question is, how do you progress through rounds of funding where you can continue to ultimately control your destiny? So it's a little different than what you're asking, but ultimately begin with the end in mind. I'm a big Stephen Covey fan and start with what does success look like to you? And don't revisit it that often. In other words, if somebody comes along with a bunch of money, um, don't say, well, maybe I, should, maybe I should take the money. If the answer is that you are, are trying to build a company, and for me, it was building an enduring company. We can talk about why that's so important. But fundamentally, if I want a company that lasts for many years, 50, 100 years, you are going to be highly focused on who you hire, what the culture is, how you develop the company, making sure that you have realistic goals. And, and ultimately, I knew that I would need successive rounds of funding to build an enduring company in an, a very highly unpenetrated space that was growing with small and medium businesses. I was right about the lack of penetration. I was right about the growth. And ultimately, going public was a financing arrangement. It, it, it was cool. Yeah. I never really dreamed that this kid from Philly would be up on that marble podium and, and ring the bell. And I can't say it wasn't an amazing experience, but it wasn't a goal. It was the ability to then continue to build the company from the IPO, which was uh, 2014 March, we, we IPO'd at 16 bucks a share and, you know, we're hovering in uh, about 80, but we're just getting started. It's awesome because it has been a great vehicle to achieve my vision of what I wanted as a company. Ultimately, there's a lot of ways to be financed and you have to look at what the upside is and the downside. Well, we went through, if you look back at our history, a lot of tough years being a public company. We were not ready from an accounting standpoint and we had to grow up really, really quickly. Was it fun? No. Was it an amazing experience to learn? Probably one of the most um, fast learning times of my life because I am not an accountant. I may be okay at sales and I'm certainly an engineer, but boy, did I have to learn accounting really, really quickly. So did I learn a lot? Becoming a public company, a compliant public company? Absolutely. So what I would say to folks is, depending on where you're going, make sure you have a clear idea of the reason you're going public or the reason you're using a SPAC or the reason you're taking money from your uncle. It all has some positives and, and some negatives. For us, going public was a very positive experience, and ultimately, it allows us to do what we're doing today, back to what you're saying, servicing 17,000 plus companies, making a profit, and also innovating for the next 10 years. 
how have you thought about, you know, building a great company culture in this environment? You know, one of the things that very candidly, you know, I struggle with is I've always run companies where we're all physically together in one location, right? Typically it's always been in Los Angeles. And now for the first time, you know, we have employees all over the US. We interact with each other, you know, on a screen just like this. And there's one part of me that feels like, hey, we need to spend more time together on these screens to build culture and to get to know each other. And there's another side of me that recognizes that people are getting burned out and they only want to do so much. And there's also the productivity issues for your business. I think a lot of company leaders are thinking through like, well, what really builds good cultures in this new normal where there's going to be even more remote work than ever before? How, what are the things you feel like you are doing right and that you figured out of how to foster really good company culture in the pandemic and, and going forward? So it concerns me as well, Jason. What I would say is there was an inkling of this over the last five years, which is the people I was hiring, you asked me how I evaluate them, how they were evaluating me is their ability to connect with our mission and our vision. So ultimately, what I found is the most productive, happiest people that we have at Trinet truly believe in our mission and vision, truly get energized by our customers. So, and it's not to say that there aren't people who can do just fine because the paycheck is really important and they can execute. But I believe the connection with the mission and vision over the next 10 years will be paramount to keeping people, for, to opening up innovation and dialogue in companies, particularly if they are remote. So I am absolutely concerned. And where my concern lies is we have over 150 open recs right now. Mm -hmm. I am telling you the last, next two years, the war for talent will be harder than it's ever been. We are just starting with that. There is so much innovation uh, going on. Our companies hired more people in Q1 than they did in the last 30 years of Q1s. Now, just think about that for a minute. In the middle of the pandemic, our companies, primarily tech, life sciences, and innovative companies have hired more net new employees during the first quarter of 2021 than they did during the last 30 years. So my fear is, how do you bring new people up to speed? How do I bring the 150 plus people up to speed when they're not bumping into each other in the halls? They don't see the crazy CEO walking down the halls. <laughs> it is going to be different, but I believe it starts with a deep connection. It goes back to this core values motivation thing, a deep connection for what the company is doing. Because let's face it, we can all get a new job tomorrow. So ultimately, if you're going to get people, bring them up to speed and keep those people, you're going to have to have that deep connection and you're going to have to make sure they understand that they are an important part of the culture. Because my fear is all about the fact that as you work from home, I don't want everybody being a free agent. I want everybody being part of a team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, we've got just a little bit of time left and I'd love maybe to end where we started. I think, you know, both you and I have a passion for small businesses. You know, half of the people in the United States work in a, in a small business. Uh, it's probably going to be an even larger and larger segment of how people are employed, especially now that self-employment is so large. Yep. I think it work differently. You know, when you think of the kinds of things at, at Trinet that you want to stand for and the kind of other companies that you want to see out there, like, what do you think are the most important things we can do to help these small businesses? Like, what, what can we do as company builders or potentially, you know, folks in government? What are, what are the keys to help fostering growth and success with folks that are trying to, you know, live their dream and build a good Main Street business? In a lot of ways, that hasn't changed. Access to capital, legal and regulatory environments that are favorable to starting and growing small businesses, 
access to great people, access to mentors that are truly willing to help without an ax to grind, and a booming economy. And as long as all those things are in place, people will rise to the challenge and build the businesses. If you go to the second order issues, things that I worry about, it's about education because the, envir the, the, the environment for business, I believe over the next two years, particularly small and medium businesses, there will be a dramatic secular recovery, which is great for my business and yours. And I think that the access to great people is going to get harder and harder as time goes on. But it is insincere to believe that everyone in our country has equal access to these amazing jobs and opportunities. And that's where my personal passion is around education and frankly, our environment. Because if the environment continues to evolve the way it is, and we're in California and you understand the wildfires and everything else, I think foundational to our existence, and now we're way away from small businesses, is education and access to jobs for everyone, and also an environment that is conducive to people living and thriving where their families are and doing what they need to do. Yeah. Well, you know, I know so many um, of your own team describe you as passionate. <laughs> and every interaction I've had with you for, you know, so many years now, it's the single thing that comes across. Like it, you're just one of the most present people that I know, whatever you're talking about or whom you're talking to, you're passionate about it. You know, there's hundreds of thousands of folks that, you know, Trinet is influencing their work and personal life, you know, every single day. And so uh, I'm excited to see where you continue and your team continues to take this business. And thank you, Burton, so much for taking time today to share your lessons and perspective, you know, with so many of us. It's really so appreciated by so many of us. Thank you, Jason. I am a huge fan. Keep doing what you're doing and we will support you in any way possible. And I would support you in any way possible. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you everybody for coming to keep joining back the series. Um, like Burton, we have some incredible guests coming up. The CEO of Chipotle, the CEO of Medallia. And so stay tuned for more great um, guests and content. Uh, and thank you, everybody. Stay safe, stay sane, and wishing everyone always, all the success possible in, in your work lives and personal lives. Thank you, everyone.